It's a positive film. It has heroes and villains, and uh, that it essentially uh, is a fun movie to watch. It's been a long time since people have been able to go to the movies and see a sort of straightforward, wholesome, fun adventure. Well, it's a fantasy. It's not science fiction so much as it is space fantasy, and it's about people. It's about. Fine, it's finally about people and not finally about science. The story when you actually put it into words is only so much nonsense to hang a great visual experience onto. It's the stuff that fairy tales are made of. It's sort of boiling down religion into a very basic concept. Uh, the fact that there is some deity or some power or some force that sort of controls our destiny, uh, works for good and also works for evil. Marvelous, healthy innocence. Great taste, wonderful to look at, full of guts, nothing unpleasant. I mean, people go bang, bang, and people fall over and are dead. But, you know, no horrors. A sort of wonderful freshness about it, a kind of like a wonderful fresh air. It's got whatever you want it to be. It's a, it's pure entertainment. It's like a roller coaster ride, and it can be interpreted as long as you enjoy it, which is the intention. Hello and welcome to Generation Skywalker. I'm Craig Spivey and today I have a very special guest with me. Now, if you are a regular listener to our Modern Way shows and you caught show 48 back in September, you might have heard me talking about this gentleman and a purchase I made from him. And he's very kindly agreed to come on the show so we can discuss his recent Star Wars related endeavours in a bit more detail. So it is my great pleasure to introduce a songwriter, musician and artist that I've long admired, uh, Darren Heyman. Darren, hello. Hello, Craig. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing fine, yeah. Uh, apart from maybe the day when I went to see Force Awakens at midnight, you couldn't have picked a more Star Wars day to talk to me. My head has been in Star Wars all day because of what we're talking about, uh, because of these paintings I've been doing. Yeah, full of Star Wars. That's good. I've also been listening to a few Generation Skywalkers to uh, to understand the tone of, of the podcast as well. So, so that's been my soundtrack. Wow. What would you say the tone is? I was thinking about this. It's like when you scratch the surface of any interest, you know, there's probably several things that we all think, oh, I'm into that bit. And as soon as you scratch the surface of it, you realise, no, I, I wasn't I wasn't that into it at all. <laughs> I was I, I was only into it, you know, a couple of inches deep into the snow. And I find listening to enthusiasts of more or less anything kind of infusing in itself. And so, you know, I've I've opened the, the back of the wardrobe into a Narnia of of of, of um, the world of collecting, which is sort of simultaneously enticing and frightening at the same time <laughs> yeah, i'll take that as a compliment yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we are going to talk a lot about star wars before we get into that i thought it'd be good to give listeners just a quick overview about you and your career it's been such an interesting and prolific career that i'm not even going to attempt to sum it up so i thought i'd give you that job okay um well i went to art college originally so i'm supposed to be an artist but uh, in the late 90s, I had a band called Hefner, which lasted for four proper albums and kind of has a reputation, largely due to the, the patronage of John Peel. So we were a, a, a John Peel band and did a lot of sessions for John. And then since then, I've done, I think, about 20 odd solo albums and... I try my hardest to write songs. 
about things that other people don't write songs about. Mm. So I did an album about uh, open air swimming pools. I did an album about the Essex witch trials in the 17th century. Yeah, I'm interested in place and time. Uh, is that good enough? Yeah. Yeah. And it's fascinating. I, mean, I think you often kind of self-impose some strict parameters in what you do, whether it's, you know, writing a recording an album on a specific instrument or writing in yeah, locations. Yeah. I, yeah, I nearly always do. Um, and I think that comes from art college and comes from a few tutors in particular. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. Sometimes I can set myself conceptual rules about what the, the record's about. Like, for instance, I did a record uh, about these places called Thankful Villages. A Thankful mm. Village is a, a village where everyone returned home alive from World War One. There's 53 Thankful Villages. So I had to write a song in each one. So it could be conceptual in that way. But then sometimes the rules can be more just about the way the music's made. So like, uh, you know, no guitars or only 12 tracks can be used. Yeah, so I do, I do that sort of tomfoolery quite a bit. <laughs> well, it's wonderfully rich tomfoolery and I would recommend anyone listening to go and check out some of your back catalogue if, if they're not familiar with uh, some of the other stuff you've done. to talk about star wars and well i follow you on twitter and i have done for a long time i'm not as active on the platform as i once was but i do dip in and certainly you know last last month i was sort of flicking around and i saw your star wars art and i, and I sort of did a double take because it was two worlds colliding for me <laughs> yeah um i've been painting sort of objects and toys so i've been painting things that sort of trigger memories for i know people my age so i've been painting things like zx spectrums commodore 64s texas speaking spells and also musical instruments like synthesizers and mostly trying to paint them from things i own uh, not always and then uh, i did a couple of star wars Things I did a, a tiny little Lego at at eighty eighty at at. Um, tell me, Craig. Uh, well, there's a there's a school of thought that subscribes to both. Really, it's. Uh, I'm only I'm only interested in what Craig thinks. At at. It was an at okay. at as a kid. It'll always be an at at. <laughs> okay, uh, that was sold quite quickly. And the other part of this story, which I think pertains more to Generation Skywalker, is that. For the longest time, I've believed my Star Wars figures to be lost. I mean, this is quite a popular story, isn't it? We suspect our parents threw them out by mistake. Uh, my parents say, and I left them in one of the places I moved. I did have Boba Fett. For some reason, Boba Fett was separated and just sat on a, 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 on a CD shelf. But other than that, everything and all the guns were missing. My mum, for some reason, was really obsessed with this. She, she, my mum, like like a lot of mums, loves bad news. <laughs> and sometimes you'd just be sitting there and she'd go, oh, it's a shame you never found all those Star Wars things. And about six months ago, she said this in front of my sister. And my sister said, oh, I know where they are. They're around my house. And so Donna, my sister, brought round uh, this ice cream tub uh, full of Star Wars figures. And so... Yeah, it's really interesting. What's really interesting is our memory. Um, and that's, I guess, why I was painting these things from childhood and our tactile memory of them. And as soon as I um, got them out of the ice cream tub, how well I knew them, how well I knew the weight of them, the feel of them, 
even some of the damage to them, even some of the things where paint had chipped away. My 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 Luke is it looks like he's got a receding hairline at the front <laughs> and things like that. And I found that really interesting how much information our memory can carry of these things. I would even say in some cases I know the figures sort of better than I know their movie counterpart in a way. You know, I think sometimes to see how some of these things look in the movies, it's like, actually, it does look like that. It doesn't really look like the figure. Um, And also what was neat, and I think think you're interested in, because I've I've sort of gathered one of your interests in the stationery, was that all of the guns... Well, not all of the guns. No one ever has all of the guns. <laughs> but uh, the guns were in a Helix Star Wars uh, tin, which would have had um, like a ruler and a pencil. And uh, well, you know exactly what was in it, obviously. <laughs> but uh, it had those things in it. So it wasn't so bad. Weirdly, though, some of them were still missing. Because when I was a kid, I was pretty proud that I'd got the, you know, the first 12. And so... Yeah, Leia, 3PO, and Death Squad Commander were missing. And oddly, the ones that are missing are the ones that when I was a kid, I bullied my sister into buying. So (laughs) I'm thinking my sister at some point over the years has said, well, these are mine, I'm having them, but I don't know. So maybe they'll turn up. Palatoy present toys from Star Wars. The princess has been captured. There's one. That was done. Our heroes are threatened by an Imperial troop transporter. Will the mighty force of the Millennium Falcon be enough to smash Darth Vader? Will Luke be able to save the princess? Only you can decide. The new Palatoy Star Wars models in toy shops now. They are waiting. So... Uh, from then, I started drawing them, and I started drawing them life size. I quite liked that I could lay the figure on the paper, and I could draw it literally next to it, so I could get all the proportions correct. And I even had an idea, although you'll realise why this was impractical, but I even had an idea of selling each figure for the amount it was worth. <laughs> So that, like, I could replace my figures by selling a drawing of it. But obviously, this is completely impractical because it would appear some of them are 300 quid and some of them are a tenner. And there's no sort of real (laughs) correlation between value of pitch or whatever. And so then you brought a Jawa from me. And then I saw in the background of your picture that there was uh, what looked like a toy shop from 1977 behind the uh, figure. And so we got talking, and I guess, yeah, you've been helping me fill in those gaps. Yeah. But here's where I'm sort of on the edge of the precipice, really, of of, of the cliff edge, really, because, yeah, there's still a few gaps from ones that were missing, which I'd quite like to have. But now I'm starting to think, oh, God, I remember I really wanted that one as a kid. And so do I start just getting ones that I fancy? And from here, do I make myself a lot poorer? Um, Because I think initially I quite like the idea that I'd find them and, yeah, for instance, I don't know, my Obi-Wan hasn't got a cape, you know, another one's missing a gun or whatever, some of their hair's ripped off. And I thought, well, I quite like that as just artefacts, you know, from my childhood, I played with them, I broke them, I lost some bits, that's what they are, I'll stick them on a shelf, and there they are from my childhood. Whereas now that I'm replacing them, obviously the temptation is to go, well, why don't I get the best there is? And I think that's something I sort of find interesting about collecting this stuff and listening to Generation Skywalker, because... In a way, there's a temptation to create the childhood we never had because we would look at the back of those figures and see these rows and rows of figures all perfectly there with their guns. And, of course, now as adults with, with jobs, we can have what we always wanted. We can, we can, we can have the, the thing we dreamt of 
that our parents wouldn't buy us when we were 10 or 12. It's very true. I mean, if you speak to a lot of collectors, if they don't have their original toys as children, they're, they're kind of on the never-ending journey to replace them. The people who do have stuff left over from their childhoods, they're the things they'd save in a fire. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and you spoke about that connection you have with these totemic items from our childhoods. And we, we had them at an age where we would just soak them up. Like you say, remember every detail. They were just real focuses of our attention. Yeah. What I've been thinking about with Star Wars for a while now and some of the things I've brought uh, are to do with this. I'm sort of increasingly interested in just the experience I had in 1977. Mm-hmm. And those two or three years up to Empire Strikes Back, the kind of trying to relive it and live the film when you couldn't watch it on TV and you couldn't really see it at the cinema. You just had uh, some comics um, and you had these plastic figures and and the idea of a world where there was just one Star Wars film called Star Wars. It's not that I don't like the other films and it's not like I haven't seen all of them. I have, but I'm just like particularly interested in that. And so that sort of manifests itself in buying, um, yeah, like uh, the collection of Marvel comics where they, where I think you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, they're like the first guys to try and do adventures after the Death Star blowing up. Yeah. Uh, um, Splinter of the Mind's Eye, uh, the radio series. Uh, I really like listening to the radio series um, a couple of years ago, and I realised the radio series was where I got false memory syndrome over some scenes that I used to think were missing from the film. And it's not that they're missing from the film. I just remember the radio version, which was a lot longer. Yeah. So I kind of quite like that world. I quite like, you know, being in a time when you actually thought Darth Vader and Anakin Skywalker were two different people. And it's also a period of wonderful artwork and the days before, brand guidelines and uh, and Photoshop files and, and people's interpretation of this crazy new movie that might or might not be a hit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, straight away in, in the Marvel comics, as soon as they get past uh, the Death Star blowing up and they have to invent aliens and spaceships, it immediately reverts to uh, sort of Buck Rogers type spaceships and space costumes. They, they don't really, the artists, haven't yet got the language of star wars and the visual language i guess now you know all the people working on say the mandalorian they sort of grown up with it they know how to make dirty land speeders look like dirty land speeders and how the aliens should look and even how the names like people who make star wars aren't ralph mcquarrie and and george lucas anymore like lots of people know how to do stars but then no one really knew how to do it and i that's also kind of interesting i also found my a young reader's edition of Empire Strikes Back. And I uncovered another memory, which was that um, I didn't find out that Vader was Luke's dad by seeing it. I found out by reading it. Mm. Because in the playground, someone said, oh, Darth Vader is Luke's dad. And I was like, get out of here. (laughs) And then I had to go on holiday for two weeks. I couldn't see the film for two weeks, so I got the book and read the book and found out that they were in fact correct because I didn't care about spoilers. I didn't care how I consumed the film or the story. I just wanted to know the story. I didn't care that I read it before I saw it.
the radio series was definitely afterwards, wasn't it? Yeah, the radio series was a good few years after. Um, was it? Yeah, I think it was 80-something. <laughs> oh, really? So, so I might have even heard the radio series of Star Wars after I'd seen Empire Strikes Back. Uh, let's have a look. I should know this stuff. No, not really. I mean, I mean, you've 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 got to uh, you've got to match the guns up to the different uh, factories um, that made the yeah. different injection molds of the figures. I, I can't expect you to know everything. Uh, yeah, it was eighty one, eighty three, and uh, Jedi was really. See, that's late the thing. Is, so that's the thing. At the same time, um, our memory is really good, and our memories are confirmed. Other times, our memories are completely wrong, aren't they? And I would have sworn that wasn't the case. I would have sworn that the radio serial kept me going between the movies or something like that. You know, um, yeah. how interesting. Yeah, I remember coming home from school because I think they played it in the daytime, like lunchtime. And I came home from school on my bike and put it on the hi fi, the 70s, like a hi fi in the front room. And the sound of the lightsaber when the lightsaber's kicked in just just sent everything rattling. I can remember it really. It's, 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 it's still really good. I listened to it. Yeah, a few years ago. I think it's really good. Yeah, I, I think the, the radio the dramatization is is really good and just just puts loads of extra stuff in it. Like they're just hanging around on the Millennium Falcon for a bit and just chatting for a bit. You sort of get find out all this in between stuff, mm. and it takes ages to get started, isn't it? There's a whole backstory with Leia on older on, but like before it even gets going. We have our heavy weapons trained on that ship, Commander. We do, Lord Tyan. But the ship appears to be just what she claims, a consular ship on a diplomatic mission. I have no doubt that she is. Princess Leia of Alderaan is a veritable angel of mercy. <laughs> Still, we mustn't become lax. Commander, the Princess Leia Organa demands to speak to the task force leader. I'll take it here. This is the Princess Leia Organa. Who's responsible for this outrage? A delight to hear your voice again, Your Highness. Lord Tyon here. I demand an explanation for this, Lord Tyon. I would be honored to explain. I'll send my personal land speeder for you. My own is being lowered now. Then I await you with great anticipation. Lord Tyon, she has no grounds for objection. Our mission on Raal Tyr has been sanctioned by the Emperor himself. Oh, I'm not worried about legalities. I shall now have the privilege of placating a most attractive and influential young woman. Back to the paintings. And then what I decided to start doing was paint them large scale, which is, yeah, really interesting. So they're about two and a half foot tall. And at my age, I have to sort of photograph them. I have the figures there to draw from, but I have to photograph them because my eye just isn't good enough to draw them in the detail needed. And yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing to do because I'm trying very hard to not paint what I know about Carrie Fisher's face or what Chewbacca looks like. And I'm trying to just paint the 1977, or indeed I am doing some Empire figures and a Jedi figures as well, or those years, uh, 80 and 83 or something. Yeah. Um, so it's weird. You're sort of painting what presumably a sculptor or something modelled in the case of the early ones, presumably without seeing the film from photographs. And there's a sort of Chinese whisper thing happening where I'm, you know, I'm painting the echo of a ghost of a thing that was Star Wars. <laughs> um, and it's, kind of interesting as well because you can forget yourself and particularly the first ones I did didn't have human faces on so it's easy to make Boba Fett or a stormtrooper's face look like a lump of plastic and just reduce it to shapes but when you're doing layer there's a problem because my brain knows it to be a human face but when you when you blow those figures up, they're really crude. They can be really crude looking, the faces, and yeah, don't really look like Carrie Fisher at all. And so there's kind of a conundrum in the painting there as to how 
crude and ugly you make it or do you make a concession to who it's supposed to be and that's the thing I've been struggling with the last few days in fact so much so that I I feel like I might stay away from the human characters (laughs) and and, um, um, just do do the masked ones we'll put some images over the uh, the enhanced version of this podcast but for people just listening how would you describe your style your interpretation of these figures well these are these paintings really are sort of quite unlike anything I've done before and they're the longest I've ever spent doing paintings I hardly ever sell paintings for more than 100 quid they're normally between 30 40 quid and 100 quid and they're watercolors and they're quite quick they're fun whereas these are taking me days and they have a a slight realist element to them in that I am trying to get them right I am trying to get the proportions exactly right and I'm trying my hardest to make them look like the figures but having said that though I think there's still sort of a looseness and an expressionist quality to them that's kind of interesting as well because I suppose I sort of assume the people that might want because I'm certainly painting them to sell eventually I'm imagining that Star Wars fans quite like detail and and like things to be correct so to that degree I sort of feel like I have to try my hardest to get it correct but I don't know there's another conundrum there I suppose in in that if you make it so correct that it could be a photograph then what's the point sort of thing so there's a there's a conundrum there in how I approach them yeah Um, I I think you're adding something to the pantheon of Star Wars figure art and I would agree with what you're saying there is there's there is a lot of expression a lot of character and life to them and I know that we've exchanged messages as you've been painting them you've been showing me the progress and and just the attention to things like shadows and shine on the plastic yeah it's an interesting thing trying to make the scale so that they're big paintings but it looks like you're painting something that's just what three inches high That's kind of an interesting challenge. So that when you're painting reflections, you use quite a big brush stroke because you're trying to make it look like a magnified picture. Mm. Um, The other thing that I'm sort of wondering about is so far, I actually, there's one exception actually. On on Darth Vader, my Darth Vader's, uh, the tip of his uh, lightsaber is bent. I think they often are. Um, so I painted it bent, so he is imperfect. But largely what I've done is I've painted the best figures. And also, actually, recently, you've helped me with some reference photographs because I, I wanted to paint some layers that I didn't have. And so you, so I've been painting your figures. But I'm wondering whether I want to always do that. I, I don't know. I don't know whether people would want to buy a picture of my Luke where his lightsaber's completely sort of snapped off, like the tips missing and his hair's a bit mushed. There's something about that that I quite like to, to, to sort of paint um, imperfect toys or toys that have been played with. Like artistically, I quite like that idea, but I don't know whether the people that might want to buy the paintings might view the paintings in the same way they would view their own collection. It's like, well, why would I want one with his gun missing or something like that? I, I see, um, yeah, I see the conundrum, but the Vader is probably one of my favourites, and it is probably because he's... His cloak's a bit ruffled, and he's and he's and he's saved his back. I can relate to it. Yeah. Well, the first one I did was uh, the biker scout, I think, and the stormtrooper. And the thing is, when you get to the Jedi figures, particularly the ones that are masked and uh, like the Imperial uh, troopers, they actually sort of don't look enough like figures mm. when I paint them. Once I've painted them and it's masked, it's like, I'm looking at the biker scout now and it's great, but you could be forgiven for thinking, oh, you've just painted a biker scout. But with uh, Darth Vader, with, and you made this point the other day to me about like the plastic, the way those uh, plastic capes work, which bear no relation to how their cloaks are in, in, in the film. And yeah, the slide out lightsabers, they're things that really tell you it's a figure and not a painting of Darth Vader. They really tell you that it's a painting of a model of Darth Vader. And so I'm thinking for the next ones, I might try and stay earlier. 
because I feel like even the progress between the three films makes them as painting look a little less like toys. I feel like they get a bit better at it by Return of the Jedi. Whereas like the original 12 and, 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 and the next ones look much more wrong, but right for what I want to do. Um, if that makes sense. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. They, they do, they yeah. do get markedly better, but then there's the odd throwback, like Han Solo with his thick neck that came with the carbonite block. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You showed me that in a picture of your collection and, and I almost feel like I want you to take it off. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it really disrupted the eye as I scanned across. I'm like, what, what's going on? What's, what's going on? What's going on with that, that, that guy there? Yeah. I mean, one thing I was going to ask you, is it a different experience to paint one that you you had as a kid that you knew in intimate detail versus one that you've just got photographic reference of? Oh, uh, yeah, that is interesting. Um, they're kind of funny, uh, so, 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 what I needed from you was, as I needed, I needed more layers, because th- so the idea is, is I don't know how to sell these, so I've, I've got a stall at Comic Con in two weeks time, so I'm going to sit there with these and see if people want them, but as we know, Star Wars isn't the most gender equal trilogy of films. So I thought, well, seeing as there's only one uh, female character that was made into figures, I'll just do all of the layers. So, yeah, there's five, isn't there? I'm, I'm looking at them now. There's a layer with her buns. There's Hoff layer. There's Bespin layer. There's uh, Bounty Hunter Boosh Bosh uh, layer and Endor layer. Um, and, yeah, so I... The only one of them I ever... Oh, and, oh no, I owned um, the Bounty Hunter one. I've got that. And I used to own uh, Leia from New Hope, but I didn't have the others. And, yeah, it's sort of funny seeing them the photos of the ones you haven't got because, well, they're kind of funny. You know, I, I think these things are great, and I think you have this relation with them. They're sort of great and terrible. <laughs> and so so I, I found the Bespin uh, Leia really funny. I, I sort of... I don't know. There's something really, there's something really ugly about her feet. They've sort of put little slippers on her, and 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 I don't. I mean, maybe she did wear shoes like that, but it, I was showing them to my girlfriend, who is, you know, knows the shape of Star Wars. Do you know what I mean? Knows it as well as most people do, and it was hard to convince her that this was a Star Wars character. Really, it looks like a little Oriental doll or yeah. something, doesn't it? The best in layer. So yeah, it did a little bit. Um, and also I'm just sort of trying to, I'm trying to think sort of outside of what I know as well. Because I reckon people understand what Chewbacca or Darth Vader is, even if they've never seen it, if they've never seen Star Wars at all. Like some of these things are so iconic that they, they have a, a cultural value. And um, I was thinking about that as well. Does Bespin Leia look like Princess Leia? Does a figure of Bespin Leia, does, do people recognise a Star Wars thing? Whereas I think like a painting of the figure of Boba Fett and it just people would even understand that that's Star Wars, even if they couldn't name the character. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a Venn uh, diagram where some crossover into that mainstream, just, let me say, pop culture, yeah, iconography, and others are a bit niche. But I'm also sort of thinking, like, that, and I was talking to you about this, I'm also thinking for Comic-Con, I should just have one deep cut. <laughs> I, should, I should have one figure that people go, oh, wow, he... He painted that Ewok. Well, that's weird. He's never good. Even if it doesn't mean I don't sell it, but I just feel like it would be fun to have it on the stall that, that, pe- that people would enjoy spotting one. What do you reckon is the most obscure Star Wars figure? Right, Not, not like the one that's hardest to buy or hardest to collect. Like, What do you think is the figure who had the least screen time, the most tenuous bit of merchandising would you say well i mean the the imperial dignitary always gets rolled out in those types of conversations just because he was a real oddity screen time wise playability wise who wants to play with the old guy in the purple dressing gown where where, where, where is he even is he as the emperor gets off the shuttle yeah he gets, there? there's, there's like a little cluster of like there's three old dudes who are his um i guess his, right. his cronies um so he's he's your sort of your classic 
I think, you know, Maydean is a curious one. One of the most expensive figures to get on a Tri-Logo card, but really a little bit unloved. But you just mentioned Ewoks. I mean, there's Lumat and Warwick, who were like Ewoks that they produced needlessly, some would argue, towards the end of the line. I mean, we, we had quite a few Ewoks. Do you know what? If you put them in a lineup and took their accessories off, I would struggle to tell them apart. Right. Uh, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, as deep cuts go, yeah, may- maybe one of those uh, right sure. extraneous right. Ewoks. Yeah, I don't think that's. I don't think either of them quite are what I want though. I'd love to see you do a power droid. I just think uh, that's see. Uh... I think I think a power droid is great, <laughs> and I like them too. But I feel like the power droid has the problem where. I need to look at it, but I've got the feeling is it won't look like a figure. It'll look like a painting of a power droid. Oh, I don't know. It's very. I mean, that sticker's very naively done. Um, I need. To, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm looking now on my phone to try and see what it looks like. But I haven't done a droid yet. Um, I also feel like R2 and C3PO present a, a few problems. I think it would be very hard to. I would oh, okay. Let's have a look at power droid. Uh, you know, I, I could see power droid sitting very comfortably in someone's Darren Heyman collection <laughs> alongside an Amstrad and speaking spell. He's re- he looks really good though. <laughs> he's, he's, he is really funny. Oh, maybe I will actually. I forgot. I didn't expect him to look so so cute. Yeah. Um, yeah. R two D two. I think presents a problem in that you, I would have to render that sticker. Hmm. And my sticker's quite beaten up, as you might expect. And so there's a question then of how beaten up to make the sticker or whatever. C3PO is hard because you've got to sort of render that metallic finish. And I've just slowly got the hang of how to render a plasticky kind of look. So I feel like I'm going to chicken out of R2 and C3PO in this run, I think. Um, so maybe, maybe for that reason, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I should do the power droid. Also, I shouldn't really say this really to my potential audience, but also, it looks quite easy. And, and, <laughs> and Leia's Le- 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 face has, has given me a migraine over the past few days, so I quite like fancy doing a faceless power droid now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've only got two weeks, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I sort of have to. I sort of have to take a few days off. I've decided. I think. I think. So I've done them in batches of six. So I've done. 12 now and i'm going to do one more batch of six so i think i've decided on three of them i think i'm going to do obi-wan jawa and uh tuscan raider i might need your help because i've my tuscan raiders lost his um his stick so i might need some reference to see how (laughs) big the stick is or i don't paint the stick um and I quite like that because, yeah, they've got the plastic capes and they're free from the original 12. And then I need three more and I'm not sure what to do. So would you go vinyl cape Jawa or cloth cape Jawa? I'd go cloth cape Jawa because it's what I've got. I don't think I've ever seen one, actually. I don't think I've, I don't... That's the only thing I knew, actually. That was the only bit of... Star Wars figure collecting uh, trivia that I knew for some reason, and I sort of, I sort of knew it from even at the time, like it was like a, an urban legend. Like, oh, if you can find a Jawa with a plastic cape, it's worth a million pounds <laughs> and stuff like that. Like, I seem to remember it being a, a legendary thing that there was this. And, and that's the only variant I knew of. Like, I knew it before meeting and talking to you. Yeah. But you're, tell, you're telling me they do exist, they, they? They do they, exist. They, they... they do exist. I mean, for a while, it was considered to be an American thing only. Um, and you only had childhood memories of people going, oh, no, I definitely had one. Well, maybe you knew somebody in the States and it came over. But, you know, in the last few years, quite a few have come to light on Palatoy cards proving that they were in that factory in Leicester and they were on our shelves. So, um, you know, I, as a kid, I remember somebody in the playground having one. I was I was convinced of it. But conventional wisdom starts to bear down upon you and you kind of go, oh, well, maybe I was wrong because you're all telling me that they weren't around. But they were. Even as a, a kid, the sort of cloth thing on the Jawa, it was just so cute. Mm. It just seemed so sweet that they'd gone to that trouble 
and it really seems to run against uh, the Chewbacca figure is the one in the first 12 that I think is just hilarious it's it's so funny and I just feel like I feel like the the Jawa I, I think out of that first 12 that's almost looks like it's got the most work in it just because of that little cloth outfit for which, him which it's is really sweet which is why they did it to, you know perceived value because it was half the size of all the other figures yeah, yeah. so for the listeners what started happening was is you went to a, a convention and picked up some things for me to fill in the gaps but the other thing i keep looking at now is, is oh god am i going to become a collector or, or am i not but for some reason i didn't buy anything for from Empire Strikes Back. I don't know what happened, but for some reason, when Empire Strikes Back came out, I either felt I was too old for toys or just was in a space where I wasn't buying toys. But when Return of the Jedi came out, I started buying figures again. I mean, we can't talk about your figures without mentioning Nia Numb. Yeah, so um, this, this is kind of what's interesting as well about these things, like listening to the, the podcast and talking to you. As we've already found, you, you sort of actually uncover memories and you start checking whether memories are correct. Um, anyway, Nia Numb, I seem to have this idea that you cut out the, the names on the, the cards and put them in an envelope to prove that you brought five or that's, six that's right. for purchases. And you sent them away. And I sent them away and Nia Numb never turned up. And once again, my mum figures into this story because my mum like just remembers bad news. So, so pretty much for like ten years straight, she was saying to me, "Oh, it's a shame your near numb never told." It's the only Star Wars name she knew. She <laughs> doesn't know who Luke Skywalker is, but she knows who near numb is because she liked to remind me that my figure didn't turn up. And uh, so, when you was going to. Uh, I think a, a toy fair or something, and you said, "Is there anything you want?" I said, "Yeah, I know what I want. I want me and Numb." And um, and of course, yes. The other irony was you sent it to me and got my address wrong, so he got lost in the post a second time. Um, he did eventually find his way to me, but I thought that was kind of like like there was some um, time vortex. If time vortex things existed in Star Wars, some sort of black hole which prevented uh, the end numb from flying to me. But he got there in the end. It's a weird figure, actually. His head seems too big, doesn't he? But then maybe the end numb's head was really big. It probably um, was, wasn't it? Well, he was, um, he was a puppet. Mm-hmm. So um, he was never... There's not, there's, there's not someone inside him? Uh, for, for all those scenes in the Millennium Falcon, it's a man with his hand up right. a, a puppet. But I think, there uh, is, I think there's one very, very brief shot where he's sort of they've got an extra walking past in the background with a, with a rubber head on. Oh. And and so that that's the other thing that occurs to me that like well maybe maybe it'd be quite good to have some of those things I never even thought of having like um, I feel I feel like I quite fancy a Hoff subset yeah I think like I think my favorite film is Star Wars but I think my favorite sort of scene is the Attacks and the snow and everything I think that's my favorite bit of Star Wars but my favorite film is the first one. Rogue three! Copy, Rogue Leader. Wedge, I've lost my gunner. You'll have to take this shot. I'll cover for you. Set your harpoon. Follow me on the next pass. Coming around, Rogue Leader. Steady, Rogue two. Activate harpoon. Good shot, Jensen. for Boba Fett I'm wondering if that's why I've got him I'm wondering if I sent away for him and that's why I've only got him from Empire Strikes Back what would you say the Boba Fett thing was you, you sent away 
like proofs of purchase or you just sent off a check and just got it sent to you? There were ads running in things like Look In and Marvel Star Wars Weekly and there were flyers in toy shops and you would send in a coupon um, together with three of the cutout character names together with 20 pence. Okay, so I can't see what you're looking at. And so to check my memory, do I remember as well that the advert sort of had a picture of him? But I've got this memory that it sort of had like like pointing out things yes. on him, like like gun on his arm yep. and, and this is his rocket pack. Yep. Like almost like a almost like an eagle kind of cutaway detailed thing saying that this is the technical spec yep. of this guy. Totally that. And the headline okay. was, Boba Fett fights for the highest bidder, but he's yours for free. <laughs> and so what year was that? So that's before Empire. That's like a preview, is it, of the character? Yeah, so that offer closed on the 30th of June, 1980. So that was the first right. first kind of look of this new character. And... Do you think that, that's the other thing about memory, do I truly remember it or have I ne- am I now creating memory out of what you've told me? But... Being that we sort of had this preview of this character, do you think that the fact that they did that, and also it's the case that he was in animated in the, the holiday special, right? Do you think that's why he he became such a, a sort of out of proportion fan favourite, like relative to his screen time? Do you think that has something to do with it, the way he was previewed like that? That's, that made him... Yeah, I think absolutely... <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. had a bearing on that. Yeah, desirable from the get go. Just, I mean, this this ad of him, bear, you know, you're looking from his feet up at him, imposing, impressive. That's right. You're looking up at him. Yeah, and that's in all of our memories. Such a powerful image. You just had to have him. Always been a great design and was a great figure. Yeah, I think it's also one of the best paintings as well. There's something really satisfying about the green panels and the yellow panels, and it was. It took a long time to do that painting, but it was sort of, yeah, I don't know, just very sort of satisfying how, how it came together and that kind of bluey grey mm. of his overalls. Because, yeah, once again, it sort of reveals the outfit to be much less high-tech than you might imagine it. I sort of wonder when they sort of recreate that outfit for um, the TV series, whether they were like, well, we, we could probably do a bit better than this now. It's essentially grey overalls, isn't it, with a few you know, bits of tin on him. It's like, there's not much to it. It's I mean, it's really like, what, how great is this armour you've got on Bounty Hunter? <laughs> I, I think they've done a very good job at sort of keeping the best of that world and, and improving on it and making it work for modern audiences. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that it's taken them so long to think, you know what I think people would quite like is more stories <laughs> within the timeline of the first three films. I mean... You know they could do it. They could do a TV show about the Max Rebo band, and everyone would watch it like over an, another Star Wars film. It's like, yeah. yeah, of course that's what you should be doing. Yeah, I bet they'll start thinking about doing things between the films, won't they? I reckon they'll start thinking about doing you know stuff between A New Hope and Empire or or stuff like that. I reckon. Eventually. Yeah, and they they're using a lot of these quote unquote you know new adventures like the Mandalorian as backdoor pilots for that kind of thing. Grogu's gone off to the to the Jedi Academy. Are we going to see Luke building the new generation of Jedi and all the things that we wanted to see in 1983? You know? I reckon they'll just occasionally throw us a bone. I reckon every now and then you'll walk, walk through a bar and, and, and there'll be a hastily CGI'd Han Solo walking out the other door or something. I reckon every now and then they'll just throw you a scrap. Yeah. But, but essentially, essentially, I think what they'll have to do is it'll just have to be masked characters or... Yeah, because they got lucky with the, the Boba Fett actor, didn't they? They got, for once, everything lined up correctly. <laughs> oh, he would be about that old. Fine, we yeah. can use him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, all, it's all good stuff. And it's being made by people who love it. So they do seem to be respecting it and being sensible with the amount of little things they drop in for us. Can't quite put my finger on it, but there was something about the Mandalorian that I don't know, just the pacing or something they got right. It had the slight sort of odd storytelling feel of Star Wars. 
you know, and if you watch Star Wars or Empire now, I mean, it's probably hard for us to appreciate this because we've grown up for it so long, but there is something slightly odd about it compared to, you know, like like Force Awakens is, is a really modern film in the way that they wisecrack and everything about it. You know, it's, it's, it definitely doesn't feel like those films did. Whereas with Mandalorian, they've, I don't know how they've done it, but they've sort of really had a look at some stuff I don't even know about, but something about how it's directed or how it's edited just has the feel of it, like much more so than the prequels mm. or the sequels. It sort of feels Star Warsy, and I don't just mean the spaceships and the sounds. I mean something in the way it's acted or, or scripted, yeah. and I can't put my finger on it, but I like it. One one thing, Grant, who's uh, one of the one of the members of our of our team here often says about the Mandalorian is is that rather than looking at Star Wars as a reference point to make it, they looked back at Westerns and Samurai films, which were Star Wars' reference point. Yeah, uh, that's right. Because, um, yeah, Lucas often talks about the Saturday morning serial thing. And it's like that, isn't it? The episodic feel of the Mandalorian, with each one having a contained story, but sort of maybe having it to be continued if in that way. I feel like they've done that. It feels like more than a casual tip of the hat in that respect. I haven't said all that, though. I've only watched it once, which I feel feels a bit weird. Like, normally with a, a new Star Wars film, even if it's a Star Wars film I don't like, by now I've watched it two or three times. And I'm not quite sure why I've only watched it once. It feels like it should have drawn me back for a second watch by now. How many times have you watched it? Like well, 56? No, I mean, this is it's interesting you say that because I'm the same. I, I watched it and there was a bit of ceremony around it. It's Friday night. I mean, the first ones I got, you know, because I'm connected and it, before Disney Plus arrived in the UK, you know, and you'd uh, do the little downloads and, you know, we'd turn all the lights off and then we'd talk about it afterwards. But, yeah, I didn't go back. And maybe I'm just waiting for a, a good chunk of time or um, some time off. Um, well, also, I wouldn't mind having it on Blu-ray. I know that, I've, you know, I've got Disney Plus. I know I can watch it whenever I want, but... It still feels like I'd, I'd maybe watch it if I had it. I don't know. It's stupid, isn't it? Why, why would that be the case? But for some reason, I guess we're of the age where we still like tactile products. Mm. You know, we still like a, a thing in our hand or something. I feel like if I owned it, I'd watch it again. I think that's what happens. Normally with a film, I watch it once, maybe twice, wait for it to come out, and then, then watch it a few more times um, because I've got it. But with Mandalorian, we've got it all the time, so I don't watch it. Maybe that's the reason. <laughs> Show me the one whose safety deemed such destruction. You must reunite it with its own kind. Where? This you must determine. The songs of eons past tell of battles between Mandalore the Great and an order of sorcerers called Jedi. You expect me to search the galaxy and deliver this creature to a race of enemy sorcerers? This is the way. I had a question, Toshi. Do the, the, the felt tip pens work? <laughs> they do. Yeah, they do. Uh. I'm 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 paranoid about them leaking. <laughs> but you know, they've survived this far. But yeah, they all they all work, I think. Both both sets. There, there might be a couple, you know, more fluid than others. Um but the, yeah, the ones the the ten pack that I pretty clearly listened to the the show where we were talking about them. Um Okay. Yeah, it was one of the I've things got... the guy said to me. Oh, and they work. <laughs> it's like well, that's not gonna make any difference to the price, but yeah. <laughs> What are you going to buy next, Craig? What am I going to buy next? Mm. Um, I mean, they've, they've announced the second wave of the retro Mandalorian figures. So I'll okay, probably yeah. buy those. They, they released those. I'm sure we, we talked about them, the, the reissues. The whole kind of collective community was all a little bit kind of like, what? Why? What's that going to do to the Valley of My Little Guns? Uh, and then they started to do the ones that they never did. And I thought, you know, they're, they're quite cute. And then when they did the Mandalorian ones, as though... Kenner had made them back in the day. Yeah, they're just kind of yeah. nice. So they they they'd be new purchases, and they probably had similar dilemmas 
to me with painting these things, didn't they? Because they probably had the dilemma of, do we make the figures as inaccurate as, say, Desert Luke with a yellow lightsaber? Like, do we... Because they could have even done that, couldn't they? Like, put errors in, like, to, to make them really look like the early Star Wars figures and the plastic capes or whatever. And I reckon they had similar dilemmas. Like, we need to make it look like the early figures, but maybe we don't need to go wholeheartedly as bad not, you know, I, mean, I, I, use, I use the word bad in inverted commas. You know I love this stuff. Mm. But um, they could have really done that, couldn't they? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, we talked about how the figures changed from the from the very first wave up to the Jedis. And they've gone vinyl cape and simple faces. Right, they have. And, right, okay, and yeah. fixed helmets. You know, they've, they've, they've gone right into that early early stuff so uh so it's interesting it's interesting sort of see that it's been successful enough for them to to spit out another another wave of those people are clearly clearly into them (laughs) um yeah i feel i'll hold off but maybe i won't (laughs) my family all collect Uh, my dad who passed away last year collected model cars and there's cabinets in the house of his cars my mum collects these china ladies like my my family collects things and i collect hornsy pottery and i also have a collection of and antique bells i collect bells so i do understand collecting i do understand the um we're just a little endorphin hit each time when you see one mm. um and whilst talking to you my girlfriend lives in barcelona and i was in barcelona three weeks ago and i think i told you i found two star wars figures in a uh back of a comic shop and they were two of the bounty hunters denga and bosk and um and i saw oh, i could buy them they're spanish they're probably rarer or something and um yeah as i say i'm sort of just teetering on the cliff edge on this one i don't think i can commit myself to trying to get it complete or anything but there is something nice about thinking i can have things i wanted when i was a kid that i never got around to getting that's quite that's quite a nice feeling yeah, so maybe that, might get might get a few things. And that special early era that you you described. There's all the other stuff in there. There's the letter set. There's the old badges. There's the copies of Looking with Star Wars on the cover. There's there's a whole kind of vein of nostalgia stuff, you know. That's uh, that's not expensive. Yeah. The other thing I told you about that I found at my mum's house um, was a jigsaw, but a jigsaw of a scene recreated with figures so it's i think it's the land speeder going into moss isley or something uh, it's definitely got luke and ben in it yeah i think um, they're, they're quite stylized scenes composites of, of things that the figures can be doing because i think that's got an explosion in it somewhere and some tuscan raiders and if it's the one i'm thinking of and they're, they're really yeah. they're really nice things and i think they're not not underrated but they were uk only they were waddington's thing so uniquely British and um, not as expensive and not as sort of widely known and, yeah, really nice objects, those. Uh, I've, they did two. Very short runs right. put together, that is, Darren. Two jigsaws. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, got the full set. Um, I feel like I had a jigsaw as well of just Han Solo and, and Chewbacca just sh- shooting as they're backing into the... Yeah, that would have been maybe, a Waddington's jigsaw in a black box. yeah. But I haven't, I haven't found that yet. Again, lots of those around, very, very cheap. People don't value them in the same way as figures. I understand that. Yeah. I, I understand why figures are the, the centre of people oh. collecting. The year is 1978, and Palatoy bring you Star Wars. Here on Death Star, Ben Kenobi combats the awesome power of Darth Vader, while Han and Thea battle for their lives in the trash compactor. Luke evades the stormtroopers with R2, D2, and C3PO, but can he escape in the X-Wing fighter? Only you will know. Only you can create your own Star Wars. Death Star, vehicles, figures, all sold separately. May the Force be with you. The paintings that exist at the moment, you did a set of smaller ones initially? Yeah, there is still a couple of those left. I think Gamma Rian Guard and, 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 and Admiral Akbar are still, are still around. And I do want to do some more of them. I do want to go back to them because 
basically, when I have this stall at Comic Con, the big ones are going to be quite pricey. Uh, I don't know what price he is to people who go to Comic Con, but um, I feel like I should have an entry level product. <laughs> um, so I am going to do some of the small ones. Six of the big ones are on my Etsy at the moment, and a couple of the small ones. But I might not put any more up for now, mainly because I just want the stall to look really full. And I want it to have loads of paintings on it. Um, one thing I would say is um, I've never been to Comic-Con before and I've got to sit there for uh, three days and I've never been to one of these things before. All I know about Comic-Con is like what I've seen on the Big Bang Theory or something. <laughs> and so so um, what I would say to people that are listening is if you're going, not that they have to buy a painting, but might be quite nice if they just come up and talk to me because I will not be in my element. I will be in an alien world. So if uh, people want to come up and say hi, that would be great because I don't think I'm going to know anyone there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it should be a good event, that one in London. So it's, it's London Comic Con and it's you're there all weekend is it the yeah yeah i think so uh it kind of states you have to be so <laughs> so i don't know what happens if i sell out by saturday do i just stand there on my own <laughs> um, but um yeah uh, it, it, they're quite strict about yeah you've got to be here the whole time so yeah I'm, I'm there uh friday night all day saturday all day sunday um i have got a helper with me and hilariously he has started watching star wars for the first time so that he feels he will have some interest in what's going on. <laughs> so so I have a friend with me and he's watching uh, four, five and six, you know, sort of as we speak. Although he is a big Game of Thrones fan and I think there should be something for him there for that, shouldn't there? There should be yeah. something to him. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, so, it's, so. It's, it's very he can, broad. He can go and look at the Game of Thrones stuff when he needs a break. That's it. And there's a few celebs there, so it should pull a few people in. Yeah. Um, no, I, I wasn't. The other thing I'm worried about is, like, what if I spend as much as I sell? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Because that happens at the indie indie label market. When I go to indie label market, I'm lucky to come away with any profit at all because as soon as I sell a record, I just spend it on the stall next to me. <laughs> so um, that would be funny if I came back with no paintings but a complete run of Star Wars figures. I would say that's an absolute result. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe, but maybe I'll treat myself to a power droid if I do well. Wonderful. So that's Friday the 19th of November to Sunday the 21st of November, London Comic Con, and uh, and you, you'll be there. Do you know whereabouts? Have you got a, a plot that people can head to? Uh, no. The form said, do you know where you want to be? I was like, I, I, don't, I don't know up from down. I don't know what's going on, so I just left it blank. So I guess... You know, I guess I'll be by the bogs or something, or something you know, like by, <laughs> by the by the bins or something. Just uh, yeah, look for the very cool paintings. Well, I sort of figured that is there a bad place to be because I figured like when I go to a car boot sale, I make sure I look at every every store, and I would have figured like most people went there would have made sure they looked at everything. That's why you're there, right? So exactly. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for for coming on. Really enjoyed that. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great.
Darren Heyman there. What a lovely guy. I hope people enjoyed listening to that chat as much as I enjoyed having it. If you do want to delve into Darren's back catalogue, go over to hefnet.com, that's H-E-F-N-E-T.com, for a comprehensive overview of all of his musical projects dating back to his beginnings in Hefner. If you want to check out his paintings, including the first two waves of his Star Wars art, go to etsy.com and search up Darren Heyman Art. If you want to keep up to date with upcoming gigs, new stuff he's working on, and even what he's been growing in his allotment, give at Darren Heyman a follow on Twitter. He's Darren.Heyman on Instagram, and there's also a Facebook page you can go and like if you uh, just search his name. All wonderful stuff. And of course, if you are at the London Film and Comic Con at Olympia between the 19th and 21st of November, you heard the man. Go and say hi. If you're new to what we do, you can visit www.generationskywalker.com and find not only audio and enhanced podcasts like this one, but also unboxings, short form, topic specific video and blogs about all sorts of things from bootleg Chinese comics to Star Wars tiki mugs. You can connect with us on social media. Just search for us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram or you can drop us a line at generationskywalker at gmail.com. My thanks again to our guest tonight for being such great company. He was Darren Heyman. I am Craig Spivey and we are Generation Skywalker. <laughs>